if memory serves me correctly, last week we finished on page 15. 2.3, other aspects of believers receiving the Holy Spirit. Is that right? Yes. That's, right. I think it's 2.3, isn't it, Beth? Yep. Yep, good. So 2.3.1, walking in the Spirit under other aspects of the believer receiving it. Um, there's one baptism but many infillings of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not just a, you get people lay hands on you for, to, to be baptised in the Holy Spirit and he rushes in and that's it. For the rest of your days you are running around full of the Holy Spirit and you don't need any more. Um, I know my own experience has verified to me many, many times that sometimes you've just got to go back and hold your cup up a little bit like... Um, what was Oliver. it? Oliver, that's Oliver. it. A little bit like Oliver saying, a little please more, please. A little yes. more. <laughs> In fact, sometimes you go, back, can I have another bucket full, please, God? Oh, right. So you only get baptised once, but especially if you minister to people, and whether that's uh, sharing with them, doing what I'm doing now, one-on-one um, -on -one ministry with somebody, praying for the sick, whatever it may be, when you are putting out, I know Kathy is the same as me, um, you wind up getting very tired very quickly. And not only physically tired, but just, oh. So we need to pump ourselves up, and I imagine that most of you do too. So walking in the Spirit. There is one baptism, but many infillings of the Holy Spirit. A couple of examples here that you might at first wonder why they're there, but I'll point that out as we go along. Acts chapter 6 and verse 3. This is the appointing of um, uh, Stephen to wait on tables. The elders, as they were then, brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom and will turn this responsibility over to them. Now, we've read that before in a different context. But in this instance, I want to emphasize the word full of the Holy Spirit. They specifically do not say who have the Holy Spirit or who have been baptized in the Spirit. They say full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, likewise, if you move up to uh, chapter 7 and verse 55, which should be just over the page if your Bible's laid out anything like mine. Um, but Stephen, this is when Stephen is being stoned, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Uh, once again, full. He's just been ministering in some considerable power and you need to make sure you're full before you do. Chapter 11 and verse 24, where you will read... Um, He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. This is... Um, I think this is in reference to... No, it's Stephen. Who was it? Barnabas. Barnabas, that's right. Barnabas, who ultimately wound up travelling with Paul on some of his missionary journeys. Once again, full of the Holy Spirit. The implication being it's very important to do it. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18... Be filled with the Spirit. Couldn't be much more explicit than that. So those of you who have been baptised with the Holy Spirit, if you're not working on keeping that level up, then you won't be working on keeping your ability to minister the power, the dunamis of God, um, to the level that you otherwise could. How? do we stay full of the Holy Spirit or how do we get this other infilling? I'm glad you asked me that. <laughs> we maintain fullness of the Spirit through, firstly, prayer. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 4. Not just necessarily, by the way, in case you're wondering, um, oh God, fill me with the Spirit, oh God, fill me with the Spirit, oh God, fill me with the Spirit. Any time you start communing with God in prayer, your little jar of Holy Spirit essence begins to fill. You can't pray and not receive from God uh, in whatever context it is. The more you pray, the longer you pray, and the more passionately you pray, the more you receive. Um, 
1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 4. That's chapter 12, that's not chapter 14. Chapter 14 and verse 4, He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. What does edify mean? It means building up. So we're not just talking about any old prayer, praying in tongues. When you pray with tongues, it's like you put your fingers... If you were a battery, it's like putting your fingers in a, in a battery charger and getting a full charge. No, that would be if you put your finger in the wall socket, that would <laughs> blow the battery off the bench. <laughs> it's more controlled through a charger. Jesus had the Spirit without limit. Fortunately, we don't. There is a circuit breaker between us and the Holy Spirit, so we get what we can contain, what we can, what we can cope with. Absolutely. But praying in tongues is so good. It's one of the few things that you can do while you're driving that is not yet illegal. Oh, I'd like to see him try and stop us. Oh. oh, no doubt there'll be a spirit cam soon to go along with the, with the phone cams and all the other cams that they're getting out there. They see your lips moving and they can't interpret it. Aha, gotcha, you were praying in tongues, weren't you? There's a $10,000 fine for you, son. But it's one of the things you can do because it doesn't, it does not engage your conscious mind. You can pray in tongues and you can be thinking something completely different. Which is why Paul writes in, uh, in further on in 1 Corinthians, um, I thank God that I pray in tongues more than all of you, but I'd rather speak a handful of words with the understanding than reams with tongues. Uh, we need to pray because when we pray with our mind, we are thinking about it, we're, we're being fruitful, we're being productive, we're focusing on God, we're doing our best to reach to God. When we pray in tongues, you can be watching the football or you can be doing gardening or whatever it may be. You just prattle away in tongues and your conscious mind's not engaged. Why? Because it's deliberately disconnected. This whole thing we talked last time when uh, you're being baptised with the Holy Spirit, the sign is tongues. Why? Because the tongue is the biggest problem we've got. I, I can't speak for anyone else here, but in this room I can tell you my tongue is my worst enemy. Uh, if, if I want to get in trouble with someone, just give it free reign and I can get anybody upset. And I think probably most of us will find the same thing, particularly before you're saved, but even after. Got to be very, very careful. So the first thing we have to do is yield the control of our tongue across to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit says, thank you, I can use that. And the prayers you pray in tongues are perfect, even though they don't mean a thing to you. doesn't matter what they mean to you because they're not being directed to you. When you pray, you're not praying for your own ears, although I sometimes think people do. You hear some really crafted, gorgeous, King James prayers coming out sometimes and I sit back and I listen to someone going at it full bore and I think oh isn't that cute he's trying to make us all think he's spiritual and the more these thou's and thines that go in there oh Lord God oh Jesus oh Father would you vouchsafe your your glorious blessings upon us and lend thine ear to the words of your humble servant and bend down from heaven that I may speak into you, Lord, these words. That are... And they go on and on and on and on. You get people like that. And as soon as you hear someone praying like that, you know God's gone off into the other room and he's turned on the football. Exactly. <laughs> he's, he's not listening. Jesus says, don't babble. The pagans babble. You know, they think by their many words they'll be heard. So when you're praying with the understanding, keep it short. Kiss. Keep it simple. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that. <laughs> but the kiss principle in prayer. Because God already knows what you want before you ask. He just wants you to ask it. This is, this is the issue. But when you pray in tongues, of course, the whole prayer is perfect because it's directed by the Holy Spirit. Your brain has got nothing whatever to do with it. It's just right. your, your heart taking control of your tongue and out comes the prayer. And it's wonderful. So let it roll because the back benefit of that is it builds you up. Builds you up, strengthens you in your inner man, inner woman. Call it what you will. No, we've all got an inner man. Sorry, girls. We've all got an inner man. Um, 
Same as we're all bride, fellas, all right? Yeah. <laughs> we're all bride, they've all got an inner man. Right. Isn't that good? There's a quality. There's a quality for you. <laughs> Oh, gosh, I could stand up now and say, oh, I identify as a bride. That's very good because it's true. <laughs> um, and by meditation in the Word of God. Turn back to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. It's nice. To, oh, he's right back near the front. It's the fourth book in. No, oh, six, I'm sorry. Yes, it's straight after the Pentateuch. Did I, why did I say fourth? I went, I went the wrong way. I'm Pentateuch five and I took one off instead of putting one on. Never mind. That was just testing you. And Kathy, you just passed. You get an extra point if you're doing the exam. Um, chapter one, verse eight of Joshua, where you will see it says, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything in it, then you will be prosperous and successful. So if you want true prosperity in your life, by the way, God's prosperity has got nothing to do with cars, money, or big screen televisions. It's got a lot to do with walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and doing good where you go, taking the gospel with you, taking the power to heal with you, taking a positive attitude with you. That's something that is so missing from the world today. Now, Psalm chapter 1. It works so well for Joshua that he conquered Canaan, so it can't be too bad. Psalm chap chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Well, actually, we'll read from the top. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. Good advice right there. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. You having a struggle in your Christian walk? You've gotten too far from the water. You need to get back into the water, get the roots down into this, and you'll stop having a problem with your walk. The old life trying to sneak back in and take over, you need to spend more time in the Word and you need to spend more time communing with God. Best way to beat a bad habit is a good prayer and a good read of God's Word. Um, and note the key to, to uh, power in the early church given in Acts chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, which we've already read in part, and that is being filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're going to wash dishes in the kitchen, be full of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to wait on the door, be full of the Holy Spirit. Certainly if you're going anywhere near the platform to preach or to sing or to, to, uh, to play music, be full of the Holy Spirit. Whatever you do, be full of the Holy Spirit. And Psalm 119, this one isn't in there, but verse 105, it's one of my favourites in the psalm. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. If you don't know the, God, the word of God, I don't care how good you think you are and how great you think your walk is, you're stumbling in the dark. Right. You cannot walk properly before God without a good sound knowledge of this word. Yes. Principally the New Testament, but also the Old because Peter, I think it is, writes that all scripture is, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Don't ask me the reference for that, but <laughs> you'll find it in there. Teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The whole lot, that includes the old. But don't base your theology on the old. And if anybody comes to you with a new teaching, which is based solely in the Old Testament, and you can't find it in the new, then their new teaching is not teaching at all. It's an opinion piece at best. To release the Spirit's power, the believer must be yielded to the Holy Spirit. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 25 says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. All right. Um, if I don't yield my life to the Spirit of God, then guess what? He stays where he is and I wander off into the bush. Once I realise I'm lost, I start screaming for help and the Holy Spirit will whistle and say, 
I'm back here where you left me. You go back and then you start walking on the path again. It's most of my life has been a zigzag, roughly following the path of life, all right? but I haven't perfected walking straight up the middle of it. I keep wandering off. Does anybody else have this trouble wandering off one way or the other? Uh, but I've noticed the zigzags are getting smaller and smaller as I get older. We're, we're a little bit like doggies. Um, when dogs are pups or when they're young, they make every mistake in the book and they have no idea what's going on around them. But if, if you live close to a dog, they learn from you. And by the time they're turning grey, they've got it all worked out. They know what's going on. If I put on my suit pants, our dogs get upset because they know it means I'm going to church and they're not going to see me for a while. They, they just know what the signs are and they get all this wisdom and they're finally relaxed and they're at ease and then they die. We're a bit the same. We're working with Jesus. We're trying to get better and better at staying balanced in our walk before him. And just about the time we get it right, he calls us home. Come on in, number one, your time is up. Um, which isn't a bad thing in itself for the person who's getting called home, but for the rest of us here, you think, oh, God, couldn't you have left them here a bit longer till they taught us how to do what they're doing so well? <laughs> Every time we see a saint go home, an old saint go home, you know you've just lost a wealth of experience and wisdom, and uh, not, not to mention good friendship or companionship. Um, so we must be yielded, the first step of which is the renewing of the mind, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Don't even need to turn it up, it's one of the ones we know. It says, do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does that mean? It means feeding your mind on something other than the pap that got you into trouble in the first place. Yes. It means not devoting your life to following just the things of the world. I'm married to a lady who all of her life has been a mad keen supporter of the Collingwood Football Club. Her father was a mad keen follower of the Collingwood Football Club. Her mother was a mad keen for Her sisters, I think, were mad keen followers of the Collingwood Football Club. Her grandfather, I don't know about her grandmother, I bet she was, goes back through generations and Kathy would not miss a game. And I found if I wanted to be just, just you know, really loving and gentle and kind, the, the way I could show her was when they were watching a match was to, to make some sort of a disparaging mark like, did you see the way that, foot, that Collingwood football player dropped the ball? You're not real good at it, is he? And that would upset her enormously. Or on a grand final, on the occasions when the Collingwood Football Club would come up to play in a grand final, because they do every now and again get to, to start playing a grand final. They're not so good at finishing them, but they start them. I will always make encouraging comments to Cathy such as, it'd uh, be better if they didn't come, because then there's not so much embarrassment when they lose. If they weren't on the field, the scores would be the same, but they wouldn't have to be there to face the consequences after. It meant a lot to her. That's the point I'm trying to make. But now, yeah, well, there's a match on. Oh, if I get round for it, I'll watch it. She put it on the other night to watch it. She watched about the first half an hour, then she put it off and went, and I think she went out of the back room with her Bible. So she disappeared, came back about halfway through the second half, watched a bit more of it. But she hasn't got the drive anymore because there are better things to fill her mind with than Collingwood Football Club. Hallelujah. All right. Um, and there are the, the same applies to all of us. The, the things, the interests, the things that used to obsess and possess us should be falling off because there are better things now in Christ than the things that used to hold us before. Uh, and if, if you're resentful of giving things up for God, you haven't yet realised that anything you give up, God will give you back a gold-plated replacement of some sort. Uh, and you'll be so glad that you gave that thing up because this opens up a new avenue. But we have to yield to him. We have to be prepared to do what God says when God says it, not in the ad breaks between quarters. All right? Um, 
so the first step is the renewing of our mind, and that's, that's entirely up to you. The Holy Spirit's helping you, but you decide. What's the highest priority for me today? Is it to go and show everybody at work how clever I am, or is it, is it to paint a picture and show everybody how artistic I am? Is it to sing a song and let everybody know how tone deaf I am? Whatever it might be, is it all about me, or is it all about he? Um, and your priorities for the day need to be set on him and what he wants. The more you do that, the more you are renewing your mind. The more you stay obsessed with the things of the past or the things that are of the world perhaps would be better because they're not necessarily of the past. They can be very present. The things of the world, the less your mind yields to God. Colossians chapter 3 uh, verses 1 to 3 um, says set your mind on things above. That's how it's renewed. Set your mind on things above. We'll actually turn that one up. Colossians 3, chapter 1 to 3. I'll, I'll probably misquoted that. <laughs> Let's just see. Oh, did I? <laughs> oh, whoopee. <laughs> Colossians 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Paul writes in, in um, Galatians 2.20, for I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, he meant it. Uh, but Paul worked as a tent maker. That's how he earned his crust be before he became a, a, a missionary to the world. And occasionally he would go back into tent making just in order to raise a few quid to keep his ministry going. As soon as he had enough money, he'd leave the tent making back into full time in the gospel. Um, so the things of the past were not holding him. All right. But some of us, our career or our, our personal position or ambition or whatever it means so much to us that we really don't want to let it go. Now, sometimes, of course, God just might be in perfect accord with your career and he might want it to go exactly where you are going in order to achieve his purposes in you. So be careful to make sure that you've got the mind of Christ before you start giving things up willy-nilly. I'm sure he loves me spending time in my workshop working on antique electronics. I'm certain that's helping me in so many ways in my walk with God. It certainly helps me sort my mind out. A Jethro. Jethro Gibbs. Oh, yes, 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 except I haven't built a boat yet. But I love working well, with timber. Well, well, he's built a few. He has. <laughs> no one ever explains how he gets them out of his basement. Um, oh, yeah, the hole in the wall. <laughs> yes. Well, hole from the wall's not going to help. It's just going to take you into the ground. <laughs> you have to have a tunnel going up. The next step is to change our behaviour through the power of the Holy Spirit. Colossians 3. Uh, 5 to 10. So you're already in Colossians 3. Put to death, therefore. Note the opening line there. Put to death, therefore. Whose responsibility is it? Mine. Put to death, therefore. Not the Spirit will help you put this to death. No. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Whoa, that's strong, isn't it? The onus is on me. The Holy Spirit helps, but the onus is on me. The decision, the daily decision, do I do this or do I not do it or do I do that instead? It's always my decision. Um, you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger... Rage, malice, slander. Oh, that one's hard. <laughs> Mention Dan Andrews. <laughs> slander. They've got to be very, very... He has got nice shoes. He's got very, very nice shoes. <laughs> I think. I've never seen them, but I'm sure they're very nice shoes. They'd be very expensive shoes. Um, slander. Um, and filthy language from your lips. All right. <laughs> If you hit your, your finger with a hammer when you're trying to drive a nail, um, some of the words that come out 
help to strip the paint later in the day, but that's not what we should do. What we should do is something like, oh golly gumdrops, I've hit my finger with the hammer, tisk tisk, oh well, and move on. <laughs> Which of course we all do, don't we? When someone backs out and hits your car, oh darn it, now I'm going to have to get this repaired. Oh, well, here's a chance to talk to this driver and see if I can share Christ with him and lift his day. Not you! And so on and so forth. Um, and it's my choice. Jesus looked at everything as an opportunity to make a difference. Even when he's being nailed to the cross, he looks at the guys driving the nails through his hands or his wrists, looks at the guys driving the nails and then looks at heaven and says, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. In the natural, that's ridiculous. Those soldiers were pretty good at nailing people to a piece of wood. They'd done it before. They knew exactly what they were doing. What they didn't know was who it was they were nailing and the consequences of that. Jesus is on the cross dying and he's looking at his mother Presumably his dad isn't in the picture anymore because he says to his, to his mother and looks at John, this man is now your son, this woman is now your mother, look after her, John. He's not thinking about himself dying on the cross. He's up there looking and saying, what can I do to help these people when I'm gone? What a brilliant attitude to life. There's no malice in Jesus, never. So we've got to try really, really hard to do these things. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of the Creator. Underline if your Bible's got a similar translation, is being, because it's a progressive tense. You are not expected to be perfect. All right, the next time you do hit your finger with a hammer or jam it in the door or something and a naughty word comes out, that does not mean God's going to say, right, that's it, sorry, sorry, Russell. No, that's it, you've gone your quota. You're not coming to heaven. Goodbye, go away. It's not like that. But I grieve him every time I do it. And if I'm not sorry that I've done it, then I grieve him even more. But he's forgiving. He understands me. He understands I still have this, this body with its corrupt desires and so on. And he's forgiving. But he's not, he's not patient forever. We should be daily getting better and better and better and better. And we will do that provided we intend to. But don't just wake up in the morning and head off into the day without giving it a thought, thinking, well, naturally, I'll be better today than I was yesterday because it's a new day, isn't it? You'll only be better if you consciously, right, if that situation comes up again, I'm not going to make that mistake. We have to make the conscious decision, all right? And that's changing our behaviour uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 1 to 11, This is actually the formula for the perfect Christian life. It really is. If you can master this, you'll live a life not far behind that of Jesus. Um, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. This is 1 Peter 4.1. Um, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. By the way, the word sacrifice often comes up in Scripture in relation to us and our relationship with God. Nowhere ever does the Bible say that being a Christian is an easy road. Quite the opposite. The evangelist will often tell you, if you want to put an end to all your trouble, get rid of all your grief, get huge amounts of money and wealth and prestige and power, come down the front and give you the American evangelist and give your life to Jesus right now and all of that will be gone. No, it'll get magnified. The difference is 
that you'll have someone with you to help you walk through it and that makes it minimal because a burden shared is a burden halved and God helps you to carry it and he will help you resolve the problems that you've got but you've still got to work through them they don't just magically disappear but you get a whole lot of new ones because you suddenly put your head up out of the foxhole and said devil I'm a Christian now yeah so the devil says oh are you we'll see about that and he will then spend quite a lot of his time, or some of his little underlings will spend quite a lot of their time trying to find ways to prick your bubble of faith yes. and to get you to look back and down instead of looking forward and up. Which is why Jesus says anyone who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for service in the kingdom of God. Don't bewail and bemoan what happened yesterday either to you or to, as a result of something you did, whatever. You can't change that. What you can change is today, and you can certainly change tomorrow. The question is never, the wrong question is always, what did I do wrong? The right question is, what can I do better? All right? Don't focus on the negative, focus on the positive. That's the way we need to be in order to change. Um, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude because he who suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. By the way, <laughs> this is not saying that everybody in this room has done all of these things, okay? But to some measure, we've probably done some of them in some way, all righty? Carousing and detestable idolatry, they think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you. Have you noticed that? If you're the white sheep, you know, there's an expression about being the black sheep of the family. Oh, my experience is more, you're okay if you're the black sheep because you fit in nicely with the flock. It's when you're the white sheep, that's when you're not very popular. Little goody-goody two-shoes. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. By the way, that's not respective, retrospective salvation. That's not saying they preach to dead bodies. That's saying people we have preached to in the past have now died and they know the reality of this. So they might be judged according to men in regard to the body but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Um... The end of all things is near. Isn't that true? Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Ooh. This means if I'm not clear-minded and self-controlled, I can't pray properly. And I wonder sometimes when I'm having difficulty with my prayer life if that's exactly the reason. My head is so full of rubbish that I just can't break out of this shell and get through to God. Um, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. It doesn't just mean within the church. It means within the relationships in your family, the relationships outside. The wrong question can be, what has this person done to me to offend or hurt me in the past? The right question is, how can I move on from there and love them anyway? Not necessarily trust them. Forgiveness and trust are not the same thing. Forgive love but watch out in case they do it again <laughs> all right just just keep a little distance in there nothing in the nothing in the bible says you have to trust someone who's badly hurt you in one way or another um, you have to forgive them even love them trust is a different thing entirely trust is earned it's not something granted it is earned um, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over multitudes of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Oh no, look who's coming down the driveway, Kathy. I suppose we'll have to feed them or get the kettle out again or I'll dig in the bottom of the barrel and see if I'll find some biscuits for something. Before. Or, oh look, isn't it wonderful? Here comes somebody. Um, we've got a bit of spare something or other we can share today, haven't we? Can we stretch the tea a bit further? Whatever it might be. <laughs> is that why you've cleaned out the bottom cupboard so you can get in there when people come <laughs> um, 
Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Faithfully administering God's grace in all its various forms. By the way, not for reward. It doesn't say that, but the, the, reason, the reason we do things for one another is not so we'll get something out of it. It's so we can give something. Because every time you give something away, God notices, oh, Frank's given that away. And he fills up the void with something much bigger and better. It's, this is one of the ways you walk in the Spirit, by serving one another. Um, if anyone speaks, you should do it as one speaking the very words of God. And if anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides, so that in all these things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. You can take those, those verses to heart and do that. You will live a brilliant Christian life. They are probably some of the hardest words in the Bible to implement, by the way. Um, sanctification through the Spirit. To be sanctified means to be consecrated to or set apart for holy use, purified and free from sin. So our sanctification is first in relation to God. And our sanctification in relation to God we call justification. Justification is instantaneous and complete at the moment of accepting Jesus as Lord and Saviour because he becomes our sanctification. 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. You don't have to work at being sanctified. God has done that. One Corinthians one thirty. It's because of Him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Do you remember? I think on the first night of this, I emphasised to you a number of times to some questioning and even blank faces. You are righteous and you are holy. If you're anything like me, you look at yourself and well, actually. Um, I'm glad you think that because the Bible says you are because that is what God has given you and when the Father looks at you he doesn't see what you did this morning or yesterday or last year or whatever he sees his son Jesus Christ and his son Jesus Christ is righteous and he is holy and that has been given to you as a gift of God's love so when the Father looks at you now you are perfect. In reality, having just built you up a little, I've got to tell you, you are far from perfect. I'm probably a little further along the line. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm far from perfect too. We all are. But legally, as the Father sees us, at the moment that we said, Jesus, I believe that you died and rose for me on the third day and I accept your lordship, your kurios over my life. Bang! Done. Accomplished. So in our relationship to the Father, it's accomplished. That's our justification. Um, did, we, did we read? Yes, we did. Yes, um, and 2 Corinthians 5.21. I have a tendency sometimes now to forget to read it, <laughs> turn it up, and Kathy reminds me later on, you didn't read that? Oh, okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Um, 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 um. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The magnificent transaction that happened on Calvary's cross. An instrument of Roman torture, a vile and agonising way to die. But in the midst of that vile and agonising death, the great transaction occurred where Christ's goodness was imputed to us and our sin was imputed to him and he paid the full price for our sin and died. I still have trouble grasping that. If ever you want an illustration of God's love, just think of Jesus on the cross. Because there's no better way for it. Um, and um, 
um, chapter 5, verse 21, uh, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 1 and verse 22. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Verse 23. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved. There's another reference, implied reference there that salvation can be lost. When we talked about Calvinism and Armenianism, Armenianism says you make a choice to come into Christ, you can also make a choice to leave. And if you constantly and deliberately and intentionally sin and bring shame upon the name of Jesus Christ, guess which door you're heading for? It's not the gate of heaven. Isn't that right? So we need to make sure that we stay true and faithful uh, to our God. But as it stands, I'm looking at a room full of holy and righteous people. And I hope you can grasp that in yourself. In relation to our neighbour, this is the other end of it. Okay, those who know us. This is um, regeneration. Certainly we, ha we, have been, we have been justified. Um, and our heart knows it. And our mind is vaguely aware of it, but our body hasn't got a clue. There's some people who teach that your body is, is made righteous too. It's not. You leave it behind. The only bodies that are going to rise up uh, is the ones that are still alive when Jesus returns at the end of the age. And even those, as they rise, will be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye into a new one. So this body that you're inhabiting now is never going to shake hands with Jesus is never going to embrace the Father, is never going to walk the pathways of heaven because it's doomed because of its unrighteousness. It's doomed because of its past life. It's doomed because of its iniquity and sin. And your heart's fantastic. Your head is running to catch up. Your body is staying as it was. Have a look at Paul's conversations on his body in... Um, uh, Corinthians, and you'll get some, some ideas about that. But we are working to change our outer ways, the way we communicate with people around us in relation to our neighbour. Our sanctification toward our neighbour is progressive and experiential, as although our inner man is perfect in Christ, the outer man is only slowly changing as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit and allow him to work in us. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. I've got a thing we've read already. No. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Note again the progressive sense of that. Are being transformed with ever increasing. So some of the things that are legally true for you are also becoming actually true as far as the people who look at you. If you're not changing, there's something wrong. And it, it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. You should still be changing unless you've got to that place of divine grace where you are just like Jesus. And if you are, would you please come out here and change places with me because I can't teach you a thing. But you could teach me. Um, and Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 15. Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians. Philippians, when was it? 2, 12, yep, thank you. 12 to 15. Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or <laughs> arguing. <laughs> so the next time someone asks you to do something, oh, do I have to? Yeah. Yep. 
Yep. Yeah, what our kids are like. You know, we, we never had a lot of chores for our children, but one of them was helping to wash dishes. Yeah. <laughs> and when you ask them, you know, whose turn is it tonight? Oh, it's his. No, it's hers. Whichever one of them it was eventually gets a, oh, do I have to do this? If you want your pocket money, yes. Mmm. <laughs> no, we do it. I think it's the same with God. Frank, I want you to go and talk to that lady over there or that gentleman down there. Oh, do I have to? I'm on holidays. <laughs> it's my day off. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. Oh, I've got an appointment. We can run off a litany of excuses and the trouble is God already knows that none of them are real. You just can't con God. God, this is one of your most irritating qualities. You cannot be conned. Because <laughs> he's always a thousand steps up the road ahead. He's not just one step ahead. He's way over the hill. He knows exactly where we're at and what we're doing. Um, so the purpose of this sanctification is not to perfect our salvation since salvation does not depend on works. Rather, our neighbour's salvation may depend upon it. See, if you're changing to become more like Christ, you get different. And your neighbours start to wonder, what's happened to Walter? Yeah, once we remember Walter, he's the one who used to go around beating up all la old ladies over in, in the park and stealing their handbags. How come he doesn't do that? He didn't. He didn't. <laughs> How come he doesn't do that anymore? And they'll say, Walter, what changed? What happened? And he'll either say, I've moved on to doing banks now, or he'll say, I've been born again. And I don't do that anymore because God is everything I need. Hallelujah, yes, I claim that in Jesus' name. <laughs> you were never a criminal that I know of, mate. <laughs> All right, but you know what I mean. I can have a joke with Walter. People read us, we're, we're described elsewhere, is it Timothy? Somewhere we're described as being letters from God. People read us. I can say anything and not be convincing if my life doesn't back it up. Jesus put it very succinctly. He said, it's by their fruit you'll know them. It's not by what I say, it's by what I do. Don't judge me by what I say because talk's cheap. I can make up all sorts of stories about how wonderful I am. None of them would be true. But if I live a life that demonstrates something of Christ's redemptive power, of his love, of his ability to interact with our lives and make them better, then people eventually are going to come up to me, as 1 Peter 3.15 says, and ask the reason for the hope that I've got. And then I can gently explain to them Jesus Christ. If I pray for someone who's sick and they're healed, I can gently explain to them Jesus Christ. So we, we, um, we're going to stop for a cup of tea. Um, did I get to the bottom of that? No, almost, but not quite. Um, people are reading us. 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and 3, which I don't think we've read, have we? <laughs> this memory of mine is getting worse, folks. I tell you, I'm glad this is the last time through <laughs> Because after this, this year, <laughs> 2 Corinthians 3. Isn't it great to be getting older? 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and 3. You yourselves, ah, here it is. You yourselves are a letter written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit, the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. If Southside as a church can somehow encourage you to move to a deeper level with Jesus Christ, when you go out into the community, you take that with you. And the people out there look at you and you say, what, what's changed in you? 
and it opens up a door for you to tell them. I've never been one to stand on street corners waving Bibles in the air and haranguing people as they walk past because I, I can't find any evidence of anybody anywhere in the Bible doing that. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't work. But for me, if I can't find it here, I'm not comfortable with it. Um, I know we've got guys down in Melbourne, but they're not doing that. They're being there and they're, they're preaching to the world and sometimes people will stop and ask them what they're talking about and that comes then straight into the 1 Peter 3.15 and they can sit down with them and lead them. Uh, but I know when Kathy and I were younger, we used to lead a youth group and of course we were pretty gung-ho in those days and the youth leader, uh, sorry, the, the youth pastor of the church was more gung-ho than we were and he said, okay, every Friday night I want the youth group down on the streets of, of uh, Bridge Street, or it was still a street back in those days, um, proclaiming the gospel to the shoppers. So we would dutifully take our kids down there, um, having taught them all sorts of strategies to reach people. And we used to, it's one of the banks made a room available to us in their building down there where we could serve cups of coffee and stuff. So we, we offer a free coffee. The kids would go out in the street and invite anyone who passed, would you like a free cup of coffee and a bicky? Well, a lot of people said yes. And once they got into the room, it's almost as though you locked and barred the door. Now, before you can go, <laughs> we're going to hit you with the gospel. Um... <coughs> Well, in all the years that we did that, I can think of two people that got born again. I look back now with embarrassment and shame that I got shanghaied into doing it because that's not the way. Far more people come into the kingdom because they see something in you that they don't have and they want to know about it. And it opens up an opportunity for you to share with them. It's important to realise we cannot crucify our own flesh because if we could, Jesus would not have needed to have come at all. Sorry, you can't change yourself by yourself. You only change yourself with the Holy Spirit's help. Um, rather, we're exhorted to walk in the Spirit and then the Spirit himself will deal with the flesh. So you go, well, we'll just turn out the first one. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Have you noticed how hard it is to do the right thing and how easy it is to do the wrong thing? You and I are on the same wavelength here, Walter. <laughs> The Holy Spirit is taking us down the narrow, difficult way that leads to life. The world and my natural desire wants to put me on the broad avenue that leads to hell. I don't want to go there. So I'm determined to stick to the narrow road. And, and if it costs, it costs. Because at the end of it, brother, is there a reward? When the King of Kings stands up with the crown of life, and places it on your head, you're going to think, I gave up nothing. It seemed hard at the time. I gave up nothing. All right, let's break for a cup of tea. All right, back to the notes. Uh, 2.3, point 2.1. Point Grieving or quenching the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's work in our lives is both to us, which is in the relationship of born of the Spirit, which is the experience of every Christian, and through us, which is baptised in the Holy Spirit, which is the experience of everyone who's been filled with the Spirit subsequent to having received him. Now, the book of Ephesians marvellously addresses these two areas. Ephesians has six chapters in it. 
Those who can't read it, I'll read it out for you. The book of Ephesians has six chapters. In those six chapters, there are 12 references to the Holy Spirit. One of them is indirect, but it depends on your, on your particular translation. Um, chapters 1 to 3 have six references, all on the subject of God working in us. And that is the area we can quench the Holy Spirit if we're not careful, if we're not cooperating with him, if we're deliberately running away from him. But the next um, three chapters, chapters four to six, also have six references of us working it out. And that's where we grieve the Holy Spirit. That hypothetical time when I said, God wants me to go and talk to that bloke over there who's sitting on his own on a park bench looking miserable. And I, no, I don't want to do that, Lord. I, I, I'm, I'm too embarrassed. I don't, I don't think that's really my thing. Um, that's when I grieve the Holy Spirit. I quench him by simply not cooperating. Grieve him by not wanting to work it out, not wanting to do what I'm here for. There's only one reason that God leaves us on earth after we get saved. Do you realize that the most dangerous thing God can do with you is leave you here after you get born again? If when we got born again, we instantly were translated into heaven, there'd be an awful lot of dead bodies on the footpath, but we'd be safe because in that moment when we are totally head over heels in love with Jesus, we're absolutely sincere about our intention to surrender everything to him. If we went home to be with him then, what a glorious reunion that would be. There's just one little trouble that back on earth there'd be stacks of dead bodies and there'd be not one single voice proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. So the only reason that we have been left here at great risk to God is so that we can prosper the gospel, the great commission, go into all the world, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's why we're here. Um, so we need to work it out. We're not saved just to be comfortable. We're saved to serve, which is why it's so important that we get filled with the Spirit. Um, the references, chapter 1, verses 3, uh, sorry, verses 13 and 17, Chapter 2, verses 18 and 22, and chapter 3, verses 2 to 5 and 14 to 16. And I will read them to you because they are worth reading. So chapter 1, uh, verse 13, it says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I really wonder, have I pushed God's patience too far? Could I possibly have lost my salvation? The witness inside is, no, you haven't. That seal is still there. That knowledge that God's spirit is still there. Grieved him or quenched him, perhaps, but lost him, no. Um, verse um, 17 of the same chapter um, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better and those are the two qualities that we need when approaching God we need wisdom and we need revelation wisdom to know how to approach him revelation to know why we're approaching him. We don't want to walk into the courts of heaven, look around and say, what am I here for? I'd probably pull a toolbox out and say, Lord, is there anything that needs fixing? No. It's all in perfect working order. You're in heaven now, son. Oh, okay. There goes that. Um, Thirdly, in verse, uh, chapter 3, verses 2 to 5. Did I read verse 20? No, I didn't read verse 22 out of uh, chapter 2, did I? I didn't do chapter 2. Skip the whole chapter. All right, well, chapter 2, verse 18. Um, thank you for reminding Just pick me up if, 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 I, if I forget. Um, 
I pray also the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious, glorious inheritance in the saints. Is that right? No, it's not. Ah, because that's chapter 1. Yes, okay. Over the page, in chapter 2, I was just testing you all, nobody picked it up, did you? Um... For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So the door's open. And it's nothing we do. It's all what God has done for us. So we have that access. Why do we need that? So that we can go and spend time with our, our God. And verse um, 22 of the same chapter um, and in him you too are being built together to become a, a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We look forward to the day when we live in heaven with Jesus. In essence, you've got a little bit of heaven in you right now because Jesus is living with you. He's chosen to come in with you. Be careful where you take him. You go to the cinema and there's some vile nonsense on there that's parading as entertainment. I mean, they're not all films are like that, but if it happens to be one that is, just think you're making the Holy Spirit look at this. Get up and walk out. Get up and walk out. You don't always know what you're going to get with the cinema. It's, it's like that Forrest Gump thing. It's like a box of chocolates. You don't know until you get in there. Um, I know Kathy and I went to see something at... at the local cinema on one occasion and it was really good and we got about 20 minutes into it someone dropped the Lord's name so we got up and walked out and it had a G rating on it and we complained to the lady in the ticket office you know that shouldn't that film shouldn't have a G it's it's blasphemous oh no one cares and I found on checking there isn't there isn't a rating for blasphemy anymore That's perfectly acceptable to blaspheme, which is why now you get it everywhere. But if I stay in there, I'm not really illustrating a good witness. I'd rather sacrifice the cost of the seat. The, I, I, the lady did say, uh, well, we've got another film you might like. I can't remember what it was. We went in to have a look at that. And it was the same thing. We got in about half an hour or so. Bang, there it is again, walked out. I don't think I've been in the cinema since. No reason to. I've got better things to do with my time than waste two hours looking at a flickering light on a screen. But just be careful because it comes into your lounge room and now you get these whopping dirty big 70 or 80 inch televisions that bring the cinema experience into your home. It brings all the depravity and rubbish into your home as well if you're not really careful in controlling the dials. So just because you're enjoying it does not mean it's good. You've dragged the Holy Spirit into that. And it's, yeah. Anyway, chapter 3, verses 2 to 5. Um, Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given me for you. That this is, uh, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I've already written briefly. In reading this, then, you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ uh, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it's now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles, to God's holy apostles and prophets. That mystery came through the Holy Spirit. Revelation. All right, and finally, verses 14 to 16 of the same chapter. Um, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how high, long, high, wide and deep the love of Christ is. We have this relationship on this side with God, which is all about edification about building us up. This is all in. This is all ministry to you. This is God sealing you. This is God revealing to you. This is God bringing you into the heavenly places. This is God giving you a new life. This is all about edification. 
the next three chapters, chapter 4, verse 3, Some of you can read it, can't you? See, Robin, some of them have got better eyes than us. I've got to take my glasses off to read the Bible. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you called to one hope and you were called to one Lord. Verse 30 in that same chapter. Um, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. And that's so easy to do. You don't offend him, but you grieve him. And if the Holy Spirit is grieving, so is Jesus, so is the Father, because they're all one. Yes. Chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Um, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do... Have nothing to do with the... Uh, oh, let me take these glasses off and I'll be able to read it. With the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, for it's shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it's light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Where it says in verse 8, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Most Bibles translate that, for the fruit of the Spirit consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Mm -hmm. yep. It's the Holy Spirit who brings light. The literal word there is spirit, not light. So that's one where the niv has not got it right. I don't know what your Bibles say there. Good, good, good. So we'll... We'll put a big cross beside the 1984 NIV when it comes to that particular verse. Um, and verse 18 of that same chapter. Um, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Why do you want to be filled with the Spirit? So you can go out and do stuff. All right? Getting filled with the Spirit doesn't change his ministry to you, but boy, does it change your ministry to other people. And chapter 6, verse 17. Um, uh, do take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God how many of you know this Bible is utterly completely useless unless you combine reading it with having the Holy Spirit in your life it's confusing I'm told it's contradictory I haven't found them, but I'm told it's full of contradictions. It's misleading. It's vague. It's full of myth and, and, and uh, imagination. All of these things you'll hear from people who try to read the Bible without having any knowledge of God, without having the guiding hand of the Holy Spirit. You get born again and open the Bible and it just leaps off the table and comes to life. Kathy used to play what I called Bible Lotto. She would get the Bible out in the morning and just randomly flick to something and look down at the page and she'd read out. She still does, did you say? Not very often. <laughs> then the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, the people living in those ruins in the land of Israel are saying Abraham was not only one man, he possessed the land. Well, I can see it's really exciting stuff in that. I can just apply that to my life straight away. No. But if I sit down and start reading a chapter of this, bang, there is always something that the Holy Spirit brings out. Maybe it's just me. I can't get away with a verse. I can get away with a chapter. Get away better with four or five chapters. And then I can look back and say... Thank you, Holy Spirit, because this is what you've given me today. 
Um, but the Holy Spirit is the one who breathes life into this and this becomes a sword when the Holy Spirit is controlling it. All right. Otherwise, it's just a stack of paper. Um, and finally, verse 18 of Ephesians 6. Um, or was that 18? No, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. What's praying in the Spirit? Praying in tongues. Walter came up in the break and told me that on one occasion he prayed in the Spirit in English. And I said, how do you know you were praying in the Spirit if you were using English? And he said, because what I just said didn't make any sense to me at all. And I went back and looked at it and thought about it and then I could see where it was going. You're yeah, fine. Because that gives you confidence that the other time you might have been praying in Italian or Dutch or some angelic tongue or whatever it might be. It's as good as having someone come up and translate it for you. I told you the story about Tony Smith and someone bringing a, a message in tongues who, uh, who could not speak Dutch, but bring it in that tongue, and then someone on the other side of the room who could not speak Dutch either, bringing a perfect translation to it. That's the way it works. Don't put it off just because it sounds strange. Um, so those latter six references are all to outworking one way or another. The first six are all to in part two. Remember this little diagram? You haven't seen it for a while. This is a picture of you. Can you see yourself in that? You are made up of three parts. You have a body, a mind, and a heart, or body, soul, and spirit, whatever you prefer. In the ideal, God speaks to your spirit, your spirit controls your mind, and your mind controls your body, and you get out into the world and you do stuff for God, the outworking of it into the world. Because you are renewed in your mind by the work of the Spirit and your mind then controls your body and you yield that to what the Holy Spirit is telling you and this side of it is brilliant. Because now you're an effective disciple of Christ and you're effectively taking the word out there. And if you are neither grieving nor quenching the Holy Spirit, that is your life down the left hand side with constant communication from God. But if I quench the Holy Spirit by refusing to do what he says, I cut off the input from God. My spirit is still very much alive, but there's no longer a flow from my spirit to my mind because my mind is staying there with his little arms crossed saying, don't want to hear this. Not going your way. That's when you quench the Holy Spirit. I've done it and I'll guarantee you've done it one way or another, one time or another. Then... If your mind is not listening to your spirit, then your body ceases to do the things that you need to do. And so we grieve the Holy Spirit by no longer being cooperative with him. And we've cut off this flow to the world. So now our life really is useless. We're not growing and we're not going. Over here, we are growing and we are going. So Philippians uh, chapter 2 and verse 12 says we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Why fear? Because you can lose it. Yes, Mary? We try to work out what those blind left-hand words. This world. W-O-R-L-D. That's out to the world, all right? God communicates with the world now through you. Not directly, through you. But the more yielded you are, the more direct it becomes. Yes. It's the purpose the church is here. It's what I was saying before. God takes an enormous risk leaving us here. It's so he has this channel to get life into a dying world. But if we're not cooperating, then we come into Philippians 2 verse 12. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Two reasons why you'd be fearful and trembling. I may lose my salvation and I may have to face God's judgment. 
Well, we're not talking about a holy fear and a holy truth. We're talking literally. If I am not, not endeavouring to walk in harmony with God and to serve him, then I'm work, walking as a rebel. And if I'm walking as a rebel, can I really expect to walk into the, the pathways of heaven? To some extent, I can because God is very loving and very forgiving, but he will not contend with a man or a woman forever. All right, so you can make mistakes in your life. Sure, you can be a bit slow sometimes. Sure, does that affect your relationship with God? No, but if it's consistent and if God is challenging you on some habit, some activity, some um, uh, priority in your life and you refuse point blank to change it, then you are starting to jeopardise your relationship with God. And if you keep going down that path, you do exactly what Israel did. You wander away and you start worshipping the idols and you turn your back on God. No one here is going to be doing that. But that can happen. So it's important that we neither quench nor grieve the Holy Spirit because if we're doing this, we are working it out and we don't need to fear. We're being effective. All right? It's not to say that everybody is going to do that all the time. I certainly don't, but I'm trying to because I know it's what God wants. Back to the notes. So that's grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit ministered to us by means of the Word of God. We as Christians have to be careful. We don't use too many of these little acronyms or little descriptions. We often talk about the Word. Someone outside, what Word? Like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, that's a Word. I've said it didn't help me much. No, we're not talking about that word. We're talking about the Bible. So when you're talking to an unsaved person, try to avoid using the expression the word and start using the expression the Bible because they understand what a Bible is. Everybody seems to know what a Bible is, regardless of their level of, of, of education in things Christian or not. Uh, inspired preaching and teaching, prophecy, wise Christian counsel and so on. Um, good preaching is, is a form of prophetic utterance because it's forth-telling the Word of God. It's why sometimes we hear somebody in church and, and you just get excited with what they're saying. It's the Holy Spirit in you saying, yeah, this is it, listen to this, pay attention. You need to hear this. Um, and same with prophecies and other things. Um, if we ignore, disobey or neglect this, we quench the Spirit. In addition, the Holy Spirit also seeks to work through us. I'm not reading those references because we've picked up the ones in Ephesians already. In addition, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit also seeks to work through us in bringing about a progressive sanctification. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we are being made more like him every day. Uh, if we deliberately impede his work by holding on to old habits, attitudes, motivations and contrary goals instead of surrendering them to the Lord, we grieve the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, I don't want to grieve God. We should all be ambitious to hear him say when we reach heaven, well done, good and faithful servant, not you made me use five boxes of Kleenexes yesterday. <laughs> not got quite the same ring, has it? Sin against the Holy Spirit. Sin against the Holy Spirit uh, may be placed in one of two categories. Any unbeliever or non-spirit-filled uh, believer who speaks against the Holy Spirit will receive no forgiveness since there's an immediate outworking because our whole relationship with the Lord depends on our relationship with his Spirit. Okay, um, I think John 6.44 says, no, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I'll raise him up on the last day. Everything that we have, we'll turn up the other one in John because it's John, John chapter 16. And reading from verse 8 through to 14. When he comes, he will convict the world, this is the Holy Spirit, of guilt in regard to sin, righteousness and judgment, in regard to sin, 
because men do not believe in me in regard to righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer and in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will give you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. And all that belongs to the Father is mine. That's why I said the Spirit will make, uh, take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while you'll see me no more, then after a little while you will see me. We rely our entire um, uh, relationship with God on the Holy Spirit. I've never seen Jesus. I've never seen the Father. Some people have visions that they assure are Jesus. Good. But they have not seen Jesus walk through that door and sit down at the table and, can I have a cup of tea? Yeah, thank you. Good. And a bicky? Yeah, fine. We haven't had that. Nor will we until he returns. Get the ovens heated up, girls. We need some bickies for when he comes. And get the kettle on. And get the kettle on. <laughs> <laughs> except we won't be needing it <clears throat> um, but everything we have in relationship to God has come through his spirit we have to be very 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 respectful and careful of his Holy Spirit as I've said to you before it grooves me when I hear especially Pentecostals refer to the Holy Spirit as it because consistently the Bible presents him as having a personality and he is not an it. He's not some nameless force. Um, and I certainly don't want to grieve him. So that's unbeliever and non-spirit-filled believer. A spirit-filled believer who blasphemes the Holy Spirit to the extent that they publicly declare the works of the Spirit to be works of Satan has committed the unpardonable sin described in Hebrews 6, 4-6. See also Hebrews 10, 26 to 29. In fact, Hebrews 10 is the better one to turn to. Um, oh, on. Hebrews 10, chapter 10, verse 26 to 29. Um, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left but only fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Hence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot he was treated as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and has insulted the spirit of grace. We're taught that sin... Oh, turn to Hebrews 6. It's only a couple of pages back. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. It's impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away, by the way, those who doubt that it's possible to fall from salvation, you'd have to say, you better rip those verses out of your Bible because that says explicitly, specifically and undeniably that you can fall away. And I've heard knuckleheads try to say, oh, yeah, but they weren't really fair dinkum. I'm sorry, it says, those who have been enlightened have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. There is no one except a demented idiot could say that that is someone who has not been saved. If they fall away. Well, if you can't fall away, then there's something wrong with those verses. And if the Bible is inerrant and if it is the word of God, then you can fall away right there to be brought back to repentance because to their loss, they're crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public 
disgrace. If you've shared in the Holy Spirit, you're in Christ. If you haven't shared in the Holy Spirit, you are not in Christ. Um, and 1 John 16, 17. Sorry, it's 1 John 5, that should be. Just, just put a little, unless I've corrected it in the copy you've got. It should be 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Um, if anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray that God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. Now, here it comes. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does, lead, uh, does not lead to death. All right, what is this sin that leads to death? Come back to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31. We're getting there. It's important to get this established because I hear so many ministries. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Uh, no, we'll pick it up in verse 30. Um, 30. He who is not with me is against me, and he, does not, he who does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. So the next time you see one of these pompous Bible teachers banging away that tongues is a work of the devil, or that there is no gift of the Holy Spirit, they are treading on very, very thin ice and underneath them are the fires of hell because they are skirting around the edge of the unforgivable sin. It's amazing that you can blaspheme Jesus Christ and get away with it, but you cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Oh, boy. So some of these Hollywood actors have got a slight hope. But... Some of these preachers who say that the things of the Spirit and the manifestations that we know and understand and experience day by day to be of the Holy Spirit, that they're of some satanic origin or that they're imaginary, is skating on very, very thin ice. Be careful because if their teaching is so far out on that, I wouldn't trust anything else they say either. And some of them are very big names, very big names indeed. Um, the only way for the Christian to chart a course in life that will be pleasing to God is to remain steadfast to the word of God and in prayer and then will the believing person experience the full work of sanctification in their lives by the Holy Spirit crucifying the deeds of the flesh and producing the fruits of the Spirit Galatians 5, to 26 which are the fruits of the Spirit which are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, kindness, self-control and faith or faithfulness that's the only way you're going to get them is by cooperating and walking with him uh, the next page doesn't belong where it is. <laughs> page 17 actually should be up beside page 29. So just flip over that. And I think we might stop there a little bit. Of